Electrical question of the day. How many amps would a 100 watt light bulb draw on a 120 volt circuit? The correct answer is 0.83. And for this one, we're going to go to our Ohm's law and use pi. Just plug in what we do know. We know that we have a 100 watts on top. We have a 120 volts and we're solving for amperage. So all we have to do is divide. We take 100 divided by 120 and that gives us 0.8333. And we're going to select D. Great job. Conductors and overcurrent protection for wind electric systems shall be calculated at no less than blank percent. And the correct answer is 125%. As we see solar and wind expanding, we're also going to see the education needs for them expand as well. Today what we're talking about is when we're sizing conductors for and selecting overcurrent protection for wind electric systems, how do we do that? Well, let's take a look at the paraphrase code language. When we get to 694.12b in part 1, it lets us know that currents in wind turbine electrical systems shall be treated as continuous. Well, as we've learned in previous parts of the code, that typically means that we're going to multiply them by 125%. Then in part B here, it removes all doubt. It says conductors and overcurrent devices circuits must be sized to handle at least 125% of the maximum current that's calculated in the previous section of 694.12a. And it tells you how to calculate these currents. And then it says that you're also allowed the rating or adjustment of the overcurrent device is allowed to be under these sections of the code, which is 240.4b and 240.4c. And what those sections allow us to do is allow us, when it's 800 amps or less, to protect the wire with a larger overcurrent device as long as we cover the known load. And that's how we get our next size up rule. Let's say we had a known load of 94 amps and we had a wire that was good for 95 amps, and we wanted to protect it with a 100 amp breaker. Well, just like in other parts of the code, that would be totally fine. We've covered the known load, which is 94 amps. Our wire is good for 95, and we're allowed to protect it with the next size up, the next standard size, and in this case, we would be code compliant. It's saying that you're allowed to also apply these rules here for wind turbines. What is the total calculated demand for a service where there are two 10 kW ranges in a residential setting? And the correct answer is 11 kW. I don't know if you know this about me, but I love to cook. When me and my wife first got together that first year, I did a lot of the cooking because I learned how to do it growing up. Over the next few years, while my mother was still alive, she learned how to cook with her, and now she is one of the best chefs that I know. But to answer this question, thankfully, we don't have to do any calculation at all. We get to use one of my favorite tables in the NEC, and that's table 220.55. This is a much more complex subject, and if you want to head over to electricalcodecoach.com, you can learn all about the nuances of the three different columns how to apply them all, and you can learn that absolutely for free if you'll just click on the free version and go to about week four, you'll find this full lesson. But today, let's answer this individual question. When you're looking at this table, you're going to look first at the left-hand side and find your number of ranges. In this case, we have two ranges. So we're going to go down to where it says two. Then we have to ask the question, which column am I going to be using? Am I going to be using column A, column B, or column C? Well, that is actually decided by the rating of one of the ranges, of the individual range, if they're all of the same KW, and in this case, they are both 10. So we need to take one of them, which is a 10 KW range, and find out what column we're in. If our range was 3.5 KWs or less, we would use column A. If our range fell in between these values, which is 3.5 to 8.75, we would use column B. 
and then our range is a 10 kW and it falls in between these values. That lets us know that we need to use column C throughout this entire process. We're going to start on the left hand side and find our number of ranges, which is two. Then we're going to cross over to column C and we'll find that the values in column C are not a multiplier, a demand factor. They are in fact a replacement value. So after we do all of this work, we're going to find that the actual demand that you would calculate for a residential service for two 10 kW ranges is going to be 11 kW. A ground rod or pipe shall be allowed to be installed at up to a blank degree angle if rock is encountered. And the correct answer is a 45 degree angle. Let's take a look at the paraphrase code language. The electrode must be installed so at least eight foot of its length is in contact with the earth. It should be driven to a minimum depth of eight feet. However, if rock is encountered, the electrode may be driven at an angle not to exceed 45 degrees from vertical. Alternatively, if rock is encountered at the angle up to 45 degrees, the electrode can be placed in a trench with a minimum depth of 30 inches. The top of the electrode should be at or below ground level unless the exposed end and the connection to the grounding electrode conductor are safeguarded from physical damage as outlined in 250.10. Let's take a visual look at what we're talking about here. Let's imagine we've driven our first ground rod on the left and then to satisfy other parts of the code in this scenario, we're going to drive our second ground rod. And let's imagine that we hit rock. We're allowed to install that second or the first or second ground rod up to a 45 degree angle. Now, I don't know if this picture is depicting perfectly 45 degrees, but you can use your imagination. And then in the case that we still hit rock and we're not able to get it that eight feet, we're allowed to dig a trench 30 inches deep and lay the rod down in that trench. Now, this is where the end part of the code where it says that the rod should be at or below ground level. You might get two different interpretations from two different inspectors. One of them might say the trench needs to be 30 inches deep all the way across, lay the rod all the way down in it and cover it up. The other one might look at it and say, hey, I want you to still angle it where the top is going to be at or below ground level, but I want you to angle that rod so that connection is still accessible, the acorn clamp connection, maybe even just for inspection. That's up to you and your authority having jurisdiction on how they interpret that code. I would be okay with either one. I think we're going to satisfy the true meaning of this, and that's to have a robust grounding electrode system. Temporary electric power and lighting installations shall be permitted for a period not to exceed blank days for holiday decorative lighting and similar purposes. And the correct answer is 90 days. And for this one, we're going to head to Article 590. Let's take a look at the paraphrase code language. When we get to Article 590.3, it talks about the time constraints for these temporary installations. Part A is talking about construction. Let's check it out. During the construction period, temporary electric power and lighting installations are allowed during the phases of construction, renovation, maintenance, repair, or demolition, demolition of buildings, structures, equipment, or related activities. In Part B, it talks about the 90-day limit. Temporary electric power and lighting installations are permitted for a maximum uh, duration of 90 days for the purposes such as holiday or decorative lighting and similar loot uses. I am the Electrical Code Coach, and if you'll head over to electricalexamcoach.com, you can check out more questions like these. If you need anything from me, you can email me at electricalcodecoach at gmail.com. Let's get to it.